extent that it's incompatible, there's going to be some problems. You can understand that, and that's why he's using this as a metaphor. He doesn't want to attack Apollos. He doesn't want to say anything bad about Apollos, but he wants to make his listeners think. And what he wants to make them think about is what is foundationally, fundamentally important, and by that to assess and judge everything else that comes along. Now, we are Christians, and they are Christians, and we're not really talking about gardens or buildings. We're really talking about our lives. And what he's talking about, instead of watering and planting and building buildings, he's talking about preaching and what's heard and what's received and thoughts and ideas that are in our minds. That's what's really being talked about. Talked about. So Paul here said, I came and taught you, and it is like a foundation. And somebody else came, and it wasn't just Apollos, there were others that came around, uh, came to this church. And as you read First and Second Corinthians, you, you get an inkling of what was being uh, said to them, and also in the other letters of Paul, because this was a common thing that went on with the Apostle Paul. But he wants his, he wants to get, see, he can't be there in Corinth. He's traveling around. He's going and starting other churches. If he were there, he could, he could address every single thing as it came up. But he wants to give them a way to stay focused on what's important and so that what they receive is always compatible with the foundation that they've got. Now, why is that important for us? You know what I notice about Christians, many Christians, and, and myself too. I mean, I've tried to work this out, you weed these things out, but we tend to be sometimes kind of schizophrenic in our Christian life. I don't know if you, do you know what I mean by that? Schizophrenic means uh, like a split personality, you know? Sometimes, depending on what we hear, we get convinced that God loves us and He's happy with us. But then sometimes we come to church and hear something that makes us think He's mad at us. And that's really true, upset with us. So is he, does he love us and he's happy with us, or is he mad at us and, and upset with us? Uh, well, we have to have some way of assessing things that we hear and assessing not even, the, not even as far as things that we hear, ideas that might enter or be in our minds. Sometimes we hear people say things. Sometimes it's just ideas we have, just instinctive ideas. So here's what Paul says. Uh, he says, I have laid the foundation and another buildeth thereon, but let every man take heed how he buildeth thereon. And for other foundation can no man lay that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now he tells us what the foundation is. He says the foundation is Jesus Christ. Now he's, we're going to see in a minute a little more explanation of that, but he's pretty plain about that. So if, you, if there's no, uh, so that there's no question in your mind, if you wonder what this, the metaphor is referring to, when he talks about the foundation, he says the foundation is Jesus Christ. So he said, that's the foundation. Well, you might say, well, of course, we're Christians. What other foundation could there be? Oh, I'll tell you what the other one could be. It could be you. Yeah. <laughs> it could be you. And that's what a lot of people, that's the, the main incompatibility in most Christians' lives. Is, is it Jesus or is it me? Uh, am I accepted with God because of Jesus or because of me? Or is it some combination of the two? And I'd like to tell you uh, straight out, first of all, it's not a combination of the two. It's either one or the other. Uh, your standing with God is either based on you and your life and your works and your righteousness and your holiness, or it's based on Jesus and His life and His works and His holiness. Because Jesus didn't come into the earth as an advisor. He didn't come as a self-help promoter. He came as a savior. He was introduced that way on the night he was born. If you've ever seen the Charlie Brown Christmas special, you know that's true. <laughs> you know, at the end, where Linus gets up, and, you know, they're all trying to figure out what Christmas is about, and then they turn off the lights and the spotlight comes on, and Linus reads the passage from Luke's Gospel when it says, Unto you this day is born the city of David a savior which is Christ the Lord. That's what it says. Is that right? We read it at Christmas time every year. But it works in July just as well as Christmas time. And when it says that Jesus was sent to them as a Savior, introduced by the angels that way. I think that's important. See, they could have said, they could have said, unto you is sent a teacher. Because he taught. Jesus was a good teacher. But they didn't say a teacher. They said a Savior. And they could have said, uh, uh, coming to you a miracle worker. Uh, because he did uh, do healings and miracles. He has that ability. Uh, but that's not what they said. They said that He is sent to you as a Savior. And so what a Savior does is He comes... Are you ready for a great revelation? Savior comes to save. 
that right? Yeah. So what that means is, if you could save yourself, uh, you don't need a savior. If you can see, savior means someone who rescues. Well, what is it that we are rescued from? Well, we're rescued or saved from a life of uh, that is uh, unsatisfactory in the eyes of God. Now, if you think if if you think that uh, by what you do and the things that we do uh, that we're going to make ourselves acceptable to God, you have to realize that God is perfect, and unless you can also be perfect, then you don't have compatibility. Does that make sense? Or if you can't be perfect, you have to have a perfect Savior. And that's why Jesus is sent as a perfect Savior. Now, Paul, he didn't stop and explain all that right here. But he did preach uh, about Jesus when he started this church in Corinth. And he says, and he's reminding them. Why is he saying this in verse 11? Other foundation can no man lay than is laid, which is Jesus Christ. He's reminding his hearers. He's reminding the Corinthians the church that he started by preaching about Jesus, he's trying to say to them, remember what the foundation for this thing is. Remember what's of foremost and fundamental importance. Now, he says a similar thing. See, he wrote this letter to 1 Corinthians, uh, to Corinthians, uh, the first letter. The second letter he wrote, uh, a little time had passed, we don't know how long. And notice 2 Corinthians chapter 11, he comes back to the same uh, idea. It's interesting to read these two letters side by side and notice that... Um, the same things keep uh, keep coming up again and again. I want to call your attention to this. He says it in a little bit different words. Second Corinthians chapter 11. Some time has gone by and he's writing to them. And if you read uh, Second Corinthians, he sounds a little more frustrated. A little more, um, oh, on edge, I guess, uh, with them. Second Corinthians chapter 11, verse 1 says this. Would to God you could bear with me a little in my folly. And indeed bear with me. For I am jealous over you with a godly jealousy. I have espoused you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. Now here's another metaphor. We've had a metaphor of a garden. We've had a metaphor of a building. And he talked about the foundation is Christ. Here he uses the found, uh, or a metaphor of a, uh, of a marriage or a love relationship. He says, I have espoused you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. He's saying it's like a marriage and I have brought you to be married uh, to Christ, and so it's sort of a closed and a, uh, a sort of a narrow uh, relationship here. But he says in verse 3, I fear. Now, what is it that he could possibly be afraid of? He said, I brought you to Christ, I came and preached Christ to you, back there in the first chapter he said, Jesus Christ is the foundation. What is it really that Paul's afraid of? He says, I fear lest by any means as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, and you read that in Genesis, the first three chapters, so your minds should be corrupted from, he says here, the simplicity that is in Christ. In Strong's Concordance, the word, the Greek word uh, could be translated as singleness. Or simplicity is good, too. I like the word simplicity just fine. He makes a reference back to a story that's right at the very beginning of the Bible in Genesis. And if you know the story, uh, God made the creation. In six days he made, you know, the, the sun and the moon and the stars and the world and, and everything in the world and the plants and the animals and everything is finished. And on uh, at the very end of everything, on the, on the sixth day, after everything else is finished, after everything else is done, he makes man. And I heard one person say the reason he didn't make man any earlier is because man would have said, let me help you with the rest of this. And that, that is a little bit... Uh, uh, about like what we're talking about here. But after it was all finished, God made man. There was nothing left to do. He made a garden, it says. Uh, and, and that represents a, a beautiful place. See, he's talked about God's garden. Or back in, Remember that? He said, you were God's garden. Uh, what, I, I heard somebody say one time, well, where did the Garden of Eden go? Oh, it's back. It's you. It's the church. <laughs> the garden is back. Um, but God made a garden. He finished the creation. He finished it all. In fact, it says that at the very end of, I believe it's uh, either chapter 1, chapter 2, and, and thus the heavens and the earth were finished. And then after that, it says God made a garden, a beautiful place. It was all finished, and then he made a special place. And then it says he formed man out of the dust of the earth and put man in the garden. He put Adam and then Eve, who came later, he put them into a place where everything was finished. He just put them in this work where he had finished. And what did they do there in that garden? Well, we don't read a lot of specifics. I mean, we read about Adam naming the animals, you know. But uh, there's a reference to God coming down and walking with them in the cool of the day. 
And really, we get the impression.